Hi, thanks for joining me. A few days ago I made a video in which I solved a problem to do with Fibonacci numbers and infinite series. And in that video, I used the formula for the nth Fibonacci number, but I didn't prove it. And in the comments, somebody requested that I make a proof video about it uh, using the proof to do with matrices. So that's what I'm going to be doing in this video. So let's just recap what the Fibonacci numbers are. We have F0, our zeroth Fibonacci number is 0, F1 is 1, and then all subsequent Fibonacci numbers are given by this recurrence relation here. F of n plus 1 equals F of n plus F of n minus 1. So the next Fibonacci number is equal to the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers. And we want to derive an explicit um, sort of formula for the nth Fibonacci number. Without much further ado, let's get stuck into the proof. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start off with a column vector with two elements in Fn plus 1 and Fn. And what we want to do is write it as some 2 by 2 matrix, which I've left kind of blank for now. We're going to fill in the elements in just a second, multiplied by this column vector here, Fn, uh, Fn, Fn minus 1. So we want to fill in the elements here so this equation kind of holds true. Well, what we, we're going to first worry about these two elements here on our top row. And of course, remember how matrix multiplication works. We're going to get Fn plus 1 equals this guy times Fn plus this guy times Fn minus 1. So we want to choose these two guys accordingly so our equation holds. So of course just by the recurrence relation we know Fn plus 1 is equal to Fn plus Fn minus 1. So we should put 1s in both these positions and of course now our top line is true. Fn plus 1 does indeed equal Fn plus Fn minus 1. Now let's worry about our second row here. We have Fn and we want to write it as a linear combination of Fn and Fn minus 1, but obviously Fn is just Fn, so I can just put a 1 here and a 0 here, and that will give me Fn equals 1 times Fn plus 0 times Fn minus 1. So this uh, it, matrix equation now holds true. So we have Fn plus 1 Fn is equal to this matrix here, which I'm just going to denote with A for now. So we have Fn plus 1 Fn is equal to A times fn fn minus 1 like so but now notice that fn fn minus 1 we can actually write as this thing here is just a fn minus 1 fn minus 2 because this thing here we can kind of just plug back into here except replacing all the ends here now with n minus 1 so we get the fn fn minus 1 this column vector here is equal to a times fn minus 1 fn minus 2 like so so of course, if we just kind of plug that in, we can put this a with this a and make an a squared, and this will become n minus 1, n minus 2, like so. But then we can kind of repeat this process until we get down to like f1 and f0. So all in all, this is equal to, I'll just put dot dot dot, is equal to a to the something, and I'll get back to that something in just a second, times f1, oopsie daisy, f0, like so. And I think this exponent here should be n, but let's just check that. Uh, here we've got, yeah, 2 plus n minus 1 gives us n plus 1. So n plus 1 gives us n plus 1 as well. So this is a to the n times f1, f0. So we have fn plus 1, fn equals a to the n times f1, f0. And we know what f1 and f0 are. We can just go and plug them in. f1 was 1 and f0 was 0, like so. And now we have this weird looking a to the n term. So we've kind of got the n Fibonacci number in terms, you know, in an explicit formula for it, except a to the n, you know, doing uh, matrices to powers, especially if n is large, can be very, very difficult. But there's a really, really nice trick we can do, and it's called diagonalization. So a is what's known as a diagonalizable matrix, and I'll go over, um, I'll go over kind of what that means in just a second. I'm not going to go over the details because that kind of needs a bit of linear algebra knowledge, and I'm not going to assume that. But I'm just going to essentially show you how we can write A in a kind of diagonalized form. And then from that, we can then derive the nth Fibonacci number. Anyway, let me clean up the whiteboard and we'll continue. OK, so we just showed that Fn plus 1 Fn is equal to A to the n times 1, 0. And A was this matrix here, 1, 1, 1, 0, like so. Now, to diagonalize the matrix A, as I said, requires kind of a bit of knowledge of linear algebra and eigenvalues and eigenvectors and things like that. But essentially, once you've done that, you get that A equals P, D, P inverse, where P and D are these matrices here. So P is 1 minus root 5, 2, 1 plus root 5, 2, 1, 1. So if you know that the Fibonacci numbers have something to do with the golden ratio, you can see uh, where the gold, or you can see that the golden ratio is hidden in here somewhere. And we have that D is equal to 1 minus root 5, 2, 0, 
1 minus root 5 over 2, 0, 0, 1 plus root 5 over 2. And the reason we use the letter D is because this guy here is a diagonal matrix. Its only non-zero elements are on the diagonal. And now what's really nice about this is because we want to raise A to the power of N, uh, it, because we can write it in this form here, there's a really, really neat trick to raising it to the power of n. But let's just look at what a squared is, just using these letters here. It's PDP inverse times PDP inverse, like so. But look, this P inverse here and this P cancel because P inverse times P is just the identity matrix and that kind of acts like one, you can ignore it. So what we're left with is PDDP inverse, which of course is just P d squared p inverse like so similarly a cubed well a cubed we can just use write as a squared times a so that's p d squared p inverse times p d p inverse like so but again this p inverse and this p will cancel like so and i'm left with a d squared times d in the middle which is d cubed so i'm left with p d cubed p inverse and this pattern kind of continues so in fact we can raise a to the power of n, a to the power of n is equal to just p d to the n times p inverse because essentially all the middle p's and p inverses are going to cancel with one another really nicely. So now we've written a cubed, sorry, a to the n, sorry, as p uh, times d to the n p inverse. And now you may ask yourself, well, hold on a minute, we've written a matrix to the power of n, which I said was really difficult, as two other matrices multiplied by another matrix to the power of n. So how have we made life any easier? Well, the key is that D is a diagonal matrix, and diagonal matrices are very, very easy to raise to the power of n because, you know, you can just verify for yourself that if you raise this to the power of n, you're simp at any diagonal matrix, you're essentially just raising each of these diagonal elements to the power of n. So that's a re really, really nice property of diagonal matrices. So you take any uh, diagonal matrix, say T, so T is a diagonal, T is a diagonal matrix, and do T to the power of N, and you can, you know, check by induction if you want to, that T to the power of N is just the same thing as if you raise each of those um, diagonal elements to the power of N, like I've done here. So now we have A to the N is equal to P times D to the N times P inverse, but we know what D to the N is as a matrix. It's just this guy here. And then P and P inverse are just constant matrix matrices, which you can just work out. So now in theory, A to the N, if I just rub all this off, we can a to the n we can go ahead and work out is just p which is this guy here so 1 minus root 5 over 2 1 plus root 5 over 2 1 1 times d to the n which we know is this guy here 1 minus root 5 over 2 raised to the n 0 0 1 plus root 5 over 2 raised to the n and then p inverse which i'm not going to write it out because i'm probably going to make a mistake but we can go ahead and just compute this, do this thing times this thing times this thing. It's just three matrices multiplied together, which we can definitely do. And then we'll have an explicit formula for A to the N. Now, because there are lots of ones and root fives and things like that floating about, I'm sure to make a mistake if I do this on camera. So I'm just gonna clean this up and just write down what A to the N is. Um, but yeah, you can go ahead and uh, do go through the details yourself. It is just multiplying three two by two matrices together. But then what we'll have is a, Two by two formula, a two by two matrix, sorry, for a to the n, and then we can just go ahead, plug that into there, and then we'll be pretty much done in finding the formula for the nth Fibonacci number. Okay, so if I've done my calculations correctly, we get that a to the n is equal to one over root five times this matrix here. So five plus to the n plus one minus five minus to the n plus one, five plus to the n plus five minus to the n, five plus to the n minus five minus to the n, and five plus to the n minus one plus five minus to the n minus one where five, 5 plus is 1 plus root 5 over 2, and 5 minus is 1 minus root 5 over 2. Now, we don't actually care too much about what a, n, a to the n is. We actually only care about what a to the n times 1, 0 is. And thankfully, we've got a 0 here, so hopefully this computation shouldn't be too difficult. So a to the n times 1, 0, so we're doing this matrix here times uh, 1, 0, is going to equal, well, we've still got this 1 over root 5 at the front from this guy here. And then when we multiply it by 1, 0, well... We're going to do, keep this term and this term is going to vanish by the zero. So we're going to get phi plus to the n plus one minus phi minus to the n plus one. And then when we do the bottom row times one zero, this thing here we're going to keep because of the one. And this thing here is going to vanish because of the zero. So we get phi plus to the n minus phi minus to the n like so. 
So a to the n one zero is just equal to one over root five times this matrix here. But remember, a to the n one zero is just f n plus one f n. So from this, we can actually just read off what the nth Fibonacci number is. We just look at the bottom row, and we get that f n is simply equal to one over root five. Oopsie daisy, root five times phi plus to the n minus phi minus to the n, like so. But at the nth Fibonacci number, we now have an explicit formula for in terms of 1 plus root 5 over 2 and 1 minus root 5 over 2 and their powers in terms of n. And what we can, you know, kind of do just to make, you know, if, if we're scared that we made a calculation error here, which I probably did, to be honest, but just to kind of, one thing we can do to check is it, look at our formula for n plus 1 and make sure it agrees with the top line. So if we were to plug in n plus 1 into this, we would get this, like so, oopsie daisy. And then this should be the same thing as our top line here. And we get 1 over root 5, 5 plus to the n plus 1, minus 5 minus to the n plus 1. So it's exactly the same. So we probably haven't made a mistake. But, you know, that, the, the interesting thing is not in the computation. It's in the final result. And essentially, the key to working out the nth Fibonacci number was using this really neat diagonalization process. So if you've not seen that before, um, perhaps that's a motivation to go and study linear algebra. Because using that, we can actually go ahead and solve other recurrence relations. So suppose instead of fn plus 1 equals fn plus fn minus 1. We can use the exact same technique, but if we say we put a 2 there and put an 8 there or something like that, uh, we can go use the same technique to work out a general formula for that. And also what's quite nice about this one is at the start we defined the first Fibonacci number f0 equals 0 and f1 equals 1 like so, and then the recurrence relation we had. But suppose we kept the recurrence relation the same but changed our two starting values. So we change this to say just an arbitrary term alpha and this one here to an arbitrary beta. Then we can just plug in alpha and beta here and then we, we can essentially work out what the nth Fibonacci number for this guy here is as well. So there's a lot you can do to kind of play around uh, with this and the, yeah the key is using this diagonalization argument. And the reason I prefer this proof than proof by induction is because this you can easily adapt to these sorts of cases like this. But proof by induction, that I guess one of the key flaws about proof by induction is when you're presented with something you can certainly prove it's true but it's not always clear where that kind of thought has come from. Why should that be true? And that is sometimes what, you know, what's most interesting about the topic. Anyway, I'm waffling now. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.